Right. But things were you know happening in a very very smooth manner as compared to some of the and by the way uh, I think that is another part of this program. The program design for Heap also involves you visiting one week abroad. Uh, I think we'll be going to Australia. So I know, so many of you you know already have an exposure to the foreign institutions and there you know professors always have to you know uh, get their own funding. Yeah. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not uh, given to them on a platter. So these things, you know, at the international level, these are already very commonplace. But when it starts happening closer to home, then I think, you know, we are dealing with those situations. So that is an example of, you know, what we can characterize as somewhat of a, you know, VUCA world that you are now operating in. And how do you deal with that? Or how do you, you know, uh, lessen the anxiety of some of your colleagues who might now have to deal with these kind of situations? I have a correction that even look here also we were always depending upon the funds only. We never get money just like from the government. Or yeah. any research work is carried through funding agencies yeah. only. So there is nothing like a coming out of the comfort zone. We yeah. were always in the same zone. Yes, some institutional facilities were provided, but that is again not from the Amachari body. So yeah. I am talking about IIT. Yeah. It was never from the IIT this one. It is again from the funds which were created by the alumni or yeah. what uh, Dean Arati's research fund. So the only situation which I look at is that government is not giving the money which they used to give for running the IITs. And they are not also allowing us to create our own funding also. So that is the complex okay. situation. Okay. okay. Otherwise everything was, even if tomorrow IIT uh, government says that in the next five years you become independent, mm -hmm. there are n number of ways we can create money. That they won't do it because they will lose the control. Yeah. So that is why we are struggling, the, at least IIT, I don't know, the other places, but IIT is struggling a little bit because what you said is correct. Earlier, if you put a quarterly term, they used to release the money. Now even after putting all the quarterly expenditure, another quarter you have to wait for the money to come. So it is a only a delayed tactics which the government is doing, nothing else at present. And in this situation, yeah. so for example, the, uh, when you say that VOCA is <coughs> happening, yeah. the best option, see this, it's all like a decision locally has to be done. For I will say that choose the best option which fits the current option, uh, current situation. I will do an example, uh, for example, you know that during this protest, one of the SPs, in Bangalore or Bangalore, yeah. okay. he has to disperse the crowd. He suddenly realized that it's very difficult to get them out of the place. So he said that, okay, stand up, we will all sing national anthem and after that you can disperse. It worked very well. So that is a situation which was exciting. He thought yeah. of himself as a leader. As yeah. a leader, he himself yeah. thought. Yeah. And brought out that particular situation. Nobody would have even thought about it earlier. Now maybe many people will follow it up. Yeah. But that is that is the called the spontaneous uh, leadership quality. Yeah. Good example. Yes, somebody else, I think. I think so. Yeah, okay. So one thing is that like in this Hukka situation, they will try to look for the positive side. Yeah. I mean, for example, if the situation is bad, I will convince that the situation is not at worst. Or worse or the situation is worse, then I will say it's not at worst. So we will still have some hope. And I uh, suggested also patience is an important thing. And try to look for where the mistake happened and see whether it can be corrected. So these three things I will do. Yeah. Look for the positive side, yeah. patience, and try to see where the mistake is happening. Is it our mistake or it happened by the circumstances? Those the three things I do. And by the way, when we talk about you know, different kinds of institutions, you are very well aware of the different types of institutions that India has, you know, whether it is institutions of national importance, um, we have private institutions, we have autonomous institutions, affiliated colleges, and you know, you might be assuming leadership roles in uh, any different type of institutions in the future. You know, they will have their own set of challenges, of course. And now with the new education policy almost, you know, in its final stages, I think things are again set to you know. Uh, take a new direction. So again, those will be opening up new implementation challenges perhaps, which have always been there after the national education policy, but it will be very well uh, punctuated. Well, let us, you know, wait and watch. A any other thoughts? Yes. See, I think when you say this is a volatile situation, I don't know.
I went day 13 in the hostel and requested students, no expression, mm. no action, just give me five minutes to meet him in his room, one to one correspondence and ask him to sit only among the his, that the, his own associates. So I was there for half an hour. It was a wrong decision, but I convinced him. The first thing is that I'm the LG word and I'm not going to expel from the postal of this and that. But two things I'm requesting you. The first, you take this order, you receive this order. Second, unofficially, I am giving you another room in the hostel. You sit to that room so that I can announce publicly you will expel from the hostel. He agreed. Switch is become normal. Sometimes you have to. It was, it was yeah. not that it is uh, the correct decision. But yeah. as in the situation. <coughs> you have to diffuse the situation. Yes. Yeah. Dialogue. See, uh, yeah. dialogue and then uh, yes. talk their interests. Yeah, the talk about it. See, some guys. Some guys. Courage is also required. Some courage is also required. Because we have an example of. We have an example of one voice sample. He, he went uh, inside yeah. the wall with, with, his, with his pistol yeah. so, and he, he specified everything. Then he identified the, uh, the main culprit yeah. and he beat him in the background personally. See, uh, two, of the, two of the culprits. ले it was a two part question. You know, not only how do you deal with it, how do you help others around you to deal with it. So you must have also, you know, you need to be prepared to learn from the situation, to continue to learn. And then also what we call as unlearning and relearning. These are also becoming very important concepts. Again, as I said earlier, our students our colleagues, ourselves, we are entering into such situations or you know we are even in the academic space, right? I mean when we talk about jobs, when we talk about employment, when we talk about job creation, uh, you have looked at reports from all over, it talks about you know uh, the jobs of tomorrow are not even created today or you know five years down the line we don't even know what kind of job roles are going to be uh, available for our next generation. With things like uh, you know social media strategist. This is a new job profile which has just appeared in the last five years. You know we didn't prepare our students to become a social media strategist. I don't think there was any degree program or anything specific to that nature. But so how do we do this? So this can be the way forward. How do we unlearn some of the old ways of doing things? How do we move along with the times? And how do we relearn? new skills and this is again the thrust of uh, government initiatives such as you know maybe skill india reskill india and so on and so forth companies and businesses have to do this all the time so this is what it entails so this might be a way forward and how do we uh, you know apply this concept of gamification now coming back to you know our uh, theme for today since many of you said gamification is also perhaps a new term for you, uh, allow me to show a small uh, video uh, which is about 10 minutes. It very nicely explains and puts things in perspective what gamification is all about and it can be used in a very effective way for our teaching learning process. Right? So let me just uh, showcase to you one small video clip and then we shall proceed.
इन सॉरी बंद हो जाएगा of the term gamification. Quite simply, gamification uses the elements of games to motivate and engage the learner. In order to better understand this concept, let's look at the elements that comprise most basic board games. First, you have a board with marked spaces on which you play. This is the game space. This is the context in which the player plays the game. Usually, a game has cards or some other elements that incrementally reveal information to the player. An element of chance exists in most games, created by a spinner or a dice. In games, you have pieces, which are basically stand-ins for the player. And finally, you have spaces on the board that reward the player for accomplishments. Gamification is the breaking up of a game into its fundamental elements. Each element of the board game can be abstracted and used to engage learners. The pieces can be considered an avatar, a representation of the player. The dice represent the element of chance. The unpredictability of the game can add mystery. The player can receive points within the game, and the in-game rewards can be thought of as digital badges. While the game board itself is the context or story encompassing all other activities. And of course, in many games, you also have competition and even cooperation among players. From an instructional context, gamification is using game-based mechanics, aesthetics, and game thinking to engage people, motivate action, promote learning, and solve problems in a non-game context. Gamification may seem like a strange or scary word, but the concepts behind it are gaining momentum. The term gamification has not been around very long. The term appears to have been coined in 2002 by Nick Powling on a web page, but the term did not gain widespread recognition until about late 2010, and now the term and concept are picking up momentum. According to figures reported on PR Web, in 2013, the gamification industry was a $421 million industry, and by 2018, it's expected to go to a $5.5 billion industry. That's a growth rate of 67%. And while gamification is gaining momentum, it's still often confused with learning games and simulations. Technically, gamification is not the same thing as a learning game or simulation. A learning game or serious game is typically a self-contained unit that has all the elements needed to engage and play for a set period of time. It has a clear beginning, middle, and end. Game-based learning is using an actual game to teach or reinforce a skill. A simulation, on the other hand, is a realistic, controlled risk environment where learners can practice specific behaviors and experience the impacts of their decisions. The most familiar type of that is a flight simulator. A simulation may contain game elements, but the focus is on a realistic experience for the learner. Here's a good way to think of the difference between a game and gamification. Think of it this way, like the old SAT problems. Gamification is to game as peace is to pie, or steering wheel is to car. Gamification uses parts of games. Another way to think of gamification is as a continuum. On one end, it's simply adding points to a learning event, and on the other is a fully immersive, 3D learning equivalent of Halo. Most gamification efforts are somewhere clearly in the middle. Additionally, gamification can be further refined into two types, structural gamification and content gamification. Structural gamification is the application of game elements to propel a learner through content with no alterations or changes to that content only the structure around the content. A common implementation of this type of gamification is to take the scoring elements of video games, such as points, levels, badges, leaderboards, and achievements, and apply
apply them to an educational context. An example of structural gamification in a learning context is when a student receives content to be learned through a quiz type game on a daily basis for a two week period via email or through a mobile app. The student receives an email with a quiz question containing content to be learned. If they answer correctly, they earn points and progress toward earning a digital badge. If answered incorrectly, the student is immediately presented a short instructional piece designed specifically to address the topic covered in the initial question. Questions are repeated at various intervals until the student demonstrates mastery of the topic. The entire process takes 30 to 90 seconds each day and is done either at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day based on the choice of the student. As the student is progressing through the content, the number of questions they answer correctly are indicated on a leaderboard for the entire class to view. This enables the learners to assess their progress relative to others. Content gamification is the application of game elements, game mechanics, and game thinking to alter content to make the content more game-like. Common implementation of this type of gamification would be to add the elements of story, challenge, curiosity, mystery, and characters to content to engage the learner. For example, adding story elements to a series of math problems to place the student in a fantasy context, or to start a classroom dialogue with a challenge instead of a list of objectives, these are both simple methods of content gamification. An example of content gamification in a learning context is when the learner takes on a role and participates within the context of a story. In teaching the topic of accounting, a learner could begin the instruction with a challenge. Complete this audit in one hour or your client goes to jail. The learner could then be dropped into the middle of an audit and asked to produce a requested list of documents for the IRS using basic accounting procedures. Within the context of this gamified learning event, the learner must complete the correct document request forms, retrieve file information, and take that information to the auditor's office to avoid arrest. The learner is scored on accuracy of documents, speed of responding to requests, and whether or not the right documents were provided to the mock auditor. This is an example of content gamification. So in conclusion, knowing the two types of gamification will help you think how you want to apply gamification to your own content that you design. Remember, Gamification is simply applying game elements, game thinking, and game mechanics when designing instruction. You can apply these ideas to help move your learner through instruction, or you can apply them to actually alter the content of your instruction. So now that you've had this brief definition of gamification, you can now use your knowledge to create your own engaging, game-like learning events. Let me also mention 
that my sessions today and tomorrow, uh, Dr. Faisal also kind of alluded to it earlier, if you are perhaps aware, there is an assessment and evaluation component to the LEAP program. So as part of that assessment and evaluation, my sessions, uh, the activities that we'll be conducting will also contribute towards that assessment and evaluation scores. Uh, it will be one component of it, right? So I should mention that as well. Um, let me uh, show you some examples. You know, this term has been around you know, less than a decade or so as they have mentioned. Uh, so even, yeah, question. So how do we know this pedagogy, gamification, is better than other pedagogy? So why yeah. are we giving a trust on it? <coughs> yeah. So how do we know it's better? In fact, a good question and uh, you are, you know, giving me a primer to what I'm going to say next. Um, exactly my point. Very, very nice question. So before the term was even a buzzword, um, when I was a doctoral student at Purdue, this is, you know, we were working on these ideas in the year 2007-2008. And this is one project, I want to give you an example. So this itself is an example and perhaps it will address your question as well. So, we developed a 3D virtual world. We used these ideas of serious games and gamification. And combining with this, you know, basic principles of learning sciences, as I explained earlier, you know, we view insights from educational theories, educational psychology, cognitive science. And we transformed an entire second year aerospace engineering design course, which used to be a classroom based pedagogy into this kind of a 3D virtual environment. The entire semester long course for about four months, a very basic gatekeeper course at Purdue, uh, you know, having a very strong aerospace and aeronautical engineering program, we took that kind of initiative and through an internal seed funding and an interdisciplinary team of professors from engineering education, my own advisor, uh, professor of Aerospace Engineering, postdoctoral student from that team, uh, master students, doctoral students, I was involved, and we had undergraduate students, uh, people from computer science, computer programming, computer vision, computer graphics, and uh, you know software development, all taken together with a small in-house team with a minimum amount of seed funding within a semester, we were able to do certain studies, we were able to explore in fact, my paper talks about, you know, exploring learning potential and students' readiness. That itself was our starting point, you know, are students ready to consume this kind of content in such an environment? Our assumption was, if they are, you know, talking about, you know, about almost 12 years back, even at that time in the US, um, <coughs> the students, you know, adolescents, the 19-year-olds, the 20-year-olds, you know, they were heavily involved into this online games uh, that had taken over, you know, they were always involved in, you know, that earlier uh, game consoles but then with the advance of the internet and this multiplayer online games, many, st I mean, that, that was a time when social media was, you know, taking its deep roots and people were playing with each other from all over the world. So we used to call them, just as we have MOOCs, MOOCs are, you know, for the educational scenario, but, um, the terminology was massive, uh, massive online games. Open or open source? No, massive uh, online. Massive online games. Open course. Books is massive no, open online course. Uh, yeah. they, they had a particular acronym. I'm just trying to remember what it is. But it was essentially this massive multiplayer online games, something like that. Multiplayer and massive online games. That was the concept. So we harness that kind of an approach, right? Here are some examples from that project, uh, screenshots in fact. We called it as an AeroQuest 3D virtual world. See, we built in the entire storyline. Our intention was, we knew our aerospace students when they enter the industry, when they graduate, when they work in the aerospace industry. The aerospace, the nature of aerospace industry is such that it requires interdisciplinary collaboration from geographically distributed teams. 
And when we say, you know, we want to give a real world experience to our students, what more real world experience can we give to them other than making them part of this phenomenon where they have to interact with a simulated geographically distributed team. They were all present on campus at you know, the uh, same location. But we simulated that environment through this gaming experience, right? And uh, our gameplay, gameplay is nothing but a storyline, was that you are an intern in a aerospace industry. 